thank you again. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Uh, well, just to introduce myself a little bit. So Jeff Rathmel at Vanderbilt. I've uh, been here for seven years with the Center for Immunobiology and work with the Cancer Center and the, one of the leaders of the host tumor interactions program, which is basically the, the, the tumor immunology program for the Cancer Center. Uh, and so this is a kidney cancer group. And Brian told me to basically 30-ish, 40 minutes talk. So I have kind of a shorter talk, but focused on some of our kidney cancer work. All of the work in kidney cancer for us sort of stems from a, and is actively involved with the Kim Rathmel lab. So this is all highly collaborative with his with her group for that. Uh, okay, so here's my disclosures. Uh, none of them are actually relevant for the talk today. So this is all independent. Okay, so our interest in, in where we've been coming from for a long period of time uh, even sort of before any kidney cancer work, has been to try to understand how metabolism shifts in cells and how this associates with proliferation and cell function and differentiation. And, and we do a lot of this in T cells. We're doing less and less. They're actually just trying to do more different kinds of cell type, but T cells have been sort of our bread and butter. And the, the basic premise is that resting T cells have a catabolic metabolism that largely supports their survival and surveillance modes. And so they're, they're not they're small, they're round, they don't seem very active just on the face of it. Now, when they're stimulated, of course, uh, all, the, all the signaling pathways, and you know, there's, there's they kind of the same signaling pathways that get turned on in oncogenic transformations. Uh, these drive an anabolic metabolism uh, that allows the cells to grow and proliferate pretty rapidly for T cells. So they get big and they start to move around and they seem much more active here. And of course, at the end of a response, they go back to this quiescent phase. So these transitions are really pretty dramatic for T cells, and they mimic some of the transitions that happen in cancer cells. And actually, that was one of the initial reasons we started to focus on this, this, this transformation here. But we can look at T cells for a lot of different things. And so this is a this anabolic transition involves obviously growing and building biomass. So the cells have to take up nutrients. And you know, one of the ways you can see that is by PET imaging. And of course, so you guys in, in the cancer world are, are very familiar with this. You know, you, this is where it's mostly used, but it's in essence, it's a glucose uptake assay uh, with a fluorodeoxyglucose since it's usually used. So um, that works really well in cancers, but it also works in really any inflammatory disease setting. So this is actually rheumatoid arthritis. Here's arrows pointed to some bone lesions, and you can see those sites uh, are taking up lots of fluorodeoxyglucose with lots of glucose uptake. Uh, in those same sites. And this is someone who's had their COVID-19 vaccination uh, in that same site. There's, there's some activity there too. So you can see all those changes in vivo. And we've done this in a couple different ways. You know, this is the, the problem with this sort of assay is it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's so bulk, you just don't really know what's going on at a cell level. So we've done things like take, take, taken um, tumors, and I'll show you a lot of that, but we've done this in, in inflammatory models too where we've induced uh, an inflammatory model, in this case, an asthma model. And then we've given uh, FDG. Uh, and then you can do a PET image with this, but you can also take the lungs out. And whereas the lungs would light up on PET, you can now fractionate them into different cell fractions and try to see uh, which are the cells that actually take up the radioactivity. And you know this is an inflammatory model, so you'd expect inflammatory cells should be taking up the, the glucose. And that's exactly what happens. These are lung or spleens, and the alternaria is how we induce this, this asthma. So uh, the, the, the lung, and, and I guess this is just a control tissue here. These, these are not immune cells. So all the non-immune cells in the lungs of mice with the asthma model, the, the non-immune cells are not really taking up glucose. In the spleens, they're not taking up glucose. Uh, but the lungs of the CD, uh, the, the lungs of these inflammatory mice, if we look at the CD11B cells, which are the myeloid cells, they're taking up a ton of glucose. And if we look at the T cells, they're also taking up a lot of glucose. So in these inflammatory models, the immune cells really become uh, very uh, glucose avid. Okay, so T cells don't just activate to different to proliferate, and they also activate and differentiate to different subsets, and there's many subsets and there's plasticity between them and hybrid models between them. Uh, we just kind of focus on uh, Tregs, TH1s, and TH17s for the most part, and for the CD4 T cells. 
We also do a little bit with CD8 T cells, which are kind of behave like the TH1s for the most part. But each one of these subsets has a different met metabolic profile. Uh, so these are um, the metabolites that we've isolated uh, by mass spec from naive T cells, TH1s, TH2s, TH17s, regulatory T cells. And the specifics don't matter uh, for this talk too much. Um, but the main thing is uh, they're all different than the naive cells. All these cells are proliferating. So they all have an anabolic program of some sort. Uh, proliferate a little bit different rates. So their anab anabolic component is, is not identical. But there's a lot of things that aren't identical. Each one of these cells, the TH1s, TH217, T-Rex, they each turn on a different metabolic program. Uh, and those differences are, turn out to be really important for their differentiation and for their function. So we've been interested in how do those differences arise and why are they important? And, and ultimately, if, if they are important, uh, if there's aspects of these pathways that are important, uh, can they be selectively important so you could potentially modulate their immune response? And that could be useful in an inflammatory disease setting if you want to have a selective immune modulation. It could also be important to know in a cancer setting if you want to be able to understand how the tissue microenvironment might have a selective effect on different cell subpopulations, or if you'd like to be able to, again, promote something like a TH1 or a CD8 cytotoxic response. Okay, so what are the, the metabolic fuels that really drive a lot of this? And uh, we're doing, I'm not gonna talk about any of this stuff today, but we're doing a lot of CRISPR screens right now that are pointing us to a bunch of different pathways uh, that are, look really, really, really interesting. But you can also just sort of start with the kind of the usual suspects, glucose, glutamine, and, and variety of lipids here. Of course, glucose being the most abundant uh, and sort of primary metabolized carbohydrate and uh, glutamine being the most abundant amino acid. And ultimately everything sort of gets funneled into the TCA cycle. And this is important for cell energetics uh, and biosynthesis, as you imagine. Also, they play big roles in cell signaling. Uh, you know, metabolic intermediates are cofactors for a lot of enzymes and a lot, lot of reactions, uh, but they're also sort of the basis for many post-translational modifications, including sort of many epigenetic modifications. So these metabolites have a lot of effects that, that could influence differentiation. Right. So if we just sort of focus on these three, we start with uh, glucose. And, and we, this is the first one we did. It goes back more than 10 years now. We, we made a, a, a transgenic mouse that overexpressed GLUT1, specifically in T cells. And just to remind everyone, there's like 14 glucose transporters. So um, just by expressing GLUT1 here, that doesn't, it actually doesn't have a massive effect because it's not even just the expression that's regulated on GLUT1, but the trafficking is highly regulated. So what happens is this actually gives you only about a 50% increase in glucose uptake. So it's not that, not that much, particularly when you think about when T cells are activated, their glucose uptake goes up, you know, more than tenfold. So, so they have a higher glucose uptake to start. And what happens in these mice is they develop over time uh, an inflammatory disorder that looks a little bit like lupus. So it's a mild lupus uh, disease. And, and this is, these are kidney sections, young mice or aged matched mice here that are non-transgenic or have the TCR transgenic. And you can see there's immunoglobulin deposition there. And if you look at a variety of other things, they, they, they have, issue, have a number of other issues, but, but it looks a little bit like lupus. So by increasing the glucose uptake, even just a little bit, that can promote inflammatory disease. Conversely, if you knock out GLUT1, and again, there's 14 glucose transporters, you knock out GLUT1 that brings down the glucose uptake by about 50% is all. So they can still take up glucose, you just can't take it up as fast. Uh, then we look in this case, it's a model for inflammatory bowel disease. And what happens here is as the mice get sick, they start to lose weight. But if the T cells are selectively deficient in GLUT1, uh, the mice don't really lose weight to the same extent. So having that, titrating that degree of glucose uptake is important to tune the inflammatory level and more glucose and presumably then more glycolysis, more inflammation. All right, glutamine is a little bit different, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Do one more comparison with glucose here, I guess. So that was with the glue glu one knockout. You can also do 2-deoxyglucose as a pharmacologic inhibitor of glycolysis. And in this case, what we did was we activated T cells and differentiated them uh, to, uh, to TH1 cells. And, this, and they're stained with cell trace violet here. So each one of these streaks is a 
as a, as a cell generation. And so here's the initial population. And as they divide, they dilute the dye. As you can see, as they dilute, as they're diluting it, they're dividing, they're upregulating this transcription factor, TBET. And this is the same transcription factor that, say, uh, a CD8 T cell would express. Uh, so they're dividing it and upregulating TBET. But if you put a little 2 deoxyglucose in there, and this is a dose that doesn't, it, it slows proliferation down, but doesn't completely block it. We're still getting cells that are out, you know, three, four, five, five divisions. Uh, but even at this population here, the ones that have divided, they still have an upregulated TBET. They still keep TBET low. So having glycolysis there is important for anabolic growth and proliferation, but it's also important for the differentiation. Again, to drive these inflammatory cells. Now, glutamine, on the other hand, gives you the opposite result for, for Th1 and cytotoxic T cells. Uh, and, and here, actually, we used an inhibitor of the enzyme glutaminase, CV839. And what happens is if you activate T cells, ordinarily, they'll make interferon gamma and IL-2. And IL but if you block glutaminase, uh, they make they make more. So they actually increase their differentiation. So you block glucose uptake, they differentiate less. You block glutamine, they differentiate more. Okay, so that's CD4 T cells, actually. This is actually CD8 T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and it shows the same thing. And I'm sorry, there's, I lost the label here. This is the control. This is actually the, the, the glutaminase knockout mouse, and you can see that they're expressing more granzyme B. So they're, they become more effector-like. By, uh, by blocking glutam glutaminase. And, but, but not only do they become more effector-like, but they also start to express more of the molecules that should be suppressive, potentially indicating more of a sign of exhaustion. Uh, and so if you block glutaminase here, PD-1 goes higher, TIM-3 goes higher, LAG-3 goes higher. So it looks like glutamine metabolism and contrast to glucose metabolism may play a role to dampen effector differentiation, and as a consequence, sort of protect from exhaustion, whereas glucose metabolism um, drives effector fate and might be more specific towards exhaustion phenotypes. And so the, this interaction between glucose and glutamine, you can measure this in a number of ways. And, and one of the ways to do it is just treat cells and then you know, see what happens to them metabolically if you if you try to use a number of inhibitors. So, so on the left here, actually, these are, these are two separate experiments. On the left, we did a seahorse experiment where we measure, um, this is a, a ECAR, it's a lactate acid secretion, so the measurement of glycolysis. This is OCAR, it's, it's mitochondrial respiration, so measurement of uh, oxidative phosphorylation. And here's the resting T cells down here. Then they're stimulated for two days, either in a control situation, and they're down here. And then here's the here's the black the, the, the black squares that are open at 24 hours and 48 hours. You can see them right there. So initially, they they the first thing all the cells do is they increase their glycolysis, and that happens in the first four hours. And then over the next day, they increase the glycolysis more and increase their oxidative metabolism, mitochondrial metabolism more. And then after that, they kind of stabilize mitochondrially and just keep pushing glycolysis farther. Now, if you block glutaminase, uh, what happens is you nothing happens really different at that four hours, uh, but then they don't increase their mitochondrial function as much, but instead they actually become more glycolytic. So the glycolysis is actually higher and we've measured this a few different ways. Uh, now you can compare that to other ways you block glutamine metabolism. Here's a pan-glutamine inhibitor, and it kind of shuts cells down a lot more. Or if there's no glutamine, it kind of shuts cells down more. So glutamine has some roles that are good, but some roles, and depending on how you block it, like with glutaminase here, actually cause the cells to increase glycolysis. And they become more reliant on that too. So here's an experiment then where you take cells with vehicle or CB839, the glutaminase inhibitor. Actually, it's not a huge difference here, but we get an increase in IL-2 and interferon gamma secretion. Uh, Low-dose 2-deoxyglucose, in this case, didn't block that, but you put the two together and all of a sudden you kind of wipe it out. So there's a compensation between these pathways and CB839 drives an increased dependence on glycolysis. Can we ask you questions along the way or, or should we? Oh yeah, by all means, sure, feel free. Uh, so. Uh, both for this one as all, and also the TH, uh, the, the T cell subtypes, I was thinking about two things. One is, uh, is the nutrient condition identical when you're growing the different T cell or uh, are, are the growth factors or the stimuli different and could that be impacting metabolism independent of you know the cells? 
intrinsic properties. And then over here as well, like when you're treating them with these metabolic inhibitors, are the cells exiting the cell cycle? And so are you promoting differentiation simply because the cell stops dividing as much? Yeah, so uh, so the first thing, when we do these, uh, do these sort of cultures, the, the in vitro cultures certainly, uh, the, the nutrient conditions are the same, okay? Uh, the media is the same. We don't do the, and actually we're very careful about refreshing the media because the media gets expired and that will depend on the rate of proliferation of the cells. So we're very careful to refresh the media, not necessarily every day, but typically every day, uh, and definitely the day before you do an assay. Uh, now the different, to get them to differentiate these different fates though, we do have to give different cytokines. Right. So the different cytokines induce different signals. Those signals start to drive the differentiation. So they, they are, you know, they're, so it's not pure metabolism, but the cytokines then set up the stage for these different pathways. And what we find is that as the metabolism gets, starts to change in response to a cytokine, it changes pretty quickly, actually. Uh, it, you need them to feed forward on each other. So it, it's, if the metabolism doesn't match, the cytokines won't you know, match the fate of what the cell is going to try to do. This, the cytokines won't do anything, or maybe the cells will transdifferentiate to something else. So they have to be coordinated. Uh, and then your last question about cells just dropping out of cycle. Yeah, that certainly could be the case. Uh, in this case here, like the, the, the doses we're using, they don't do that. CBA39 does not cause the cells to drop out of cycle. They might cycle slightly slower at first, but, um, and 2-deoxyglucose is the same, but it's not a not a dramatic effect, uh, not in these not in these settings at least. You certainly can knock cells sort of down pretty hard if you if you up the doses of these things, but that, that wasn't the case here at least. So does that answer your questions? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. All right, all right. So let me get into some kidney cancer now. All right, so I sort of set the stage that. Uh, glucose and glutamine have potentially opposite functions where uh, if you have increased glucose reliance, you might become more exhausted and gain more effector function and increased glutamine reliance, you may actually uh, differentiate less. Okay, so now I'll get into kidney cancer. So uh, these are some data from a, a JCA insight paper we had, I guess, in 2017, but this is just from the TCGA where we just pulled out um, we, we got rid of all the, the liquid tumors and lymphoid sort of structure, just, let's just the solid tumors. And then just say, who has, the, who has the greatest CD8 expression across all these different cancers? And the one on the, the far right here uh, is, is clear cell renal cell carcinoma uh, has the greatest CD8 uh, signature. Uh, same thing for CD4 T cells actually as well. And if you just look at a kidney, tumor section. There's lots of CD8 T cells in here. This is kidney tumor, uh, DAPIs for the, all the nuclei, and then CD8 here. So, uh, so there's lots of, lots of T cells in there. Lots of macrophages as well. And, you know, there's a lot of data now about how macrophage populations might, can be predictive of some of the outcomes. All right. So we, but we were interested in the T cells initially. And, and the question was, well, what are those T cells like? So we would get these, these kidney tumors, uh, and we get, you know, one or so, one or two a week. And we could then take the cells and make single cell suspensions of it, not isolating the T cells per se, just sort of still keeping everything there, but getting them suspended so that we can activate them or try to activate them and, and do flow cytometric assays, sort of manipulate them. And what happens is if we look control T cells or TILs, we can, we can actually stimulate these cells. They don't stimulate as well as you'd anticipate a control peripheral blood uh, T cell to activate, but some of the CD8 T cells will activate, increase expression of CD25, uh, CD71 transferrin receptor, a little bit of growth in cell size. And this is cell proliferation. It's the same sort of story. This is a control healthy donor, peripheral blood T cells. These are uh, peripheral blood from uh, kidney cancer patients, and they'll also proliferate as they dilute out this dye. But the T cells from the, the, the till, uh, some most don't divide, but you get a fraction that, that do. Okay, so we did a lot of work to really try to understand why is it that these cells have these uh, activation defects, and, 
And in essence, it's kind of a question is what does exhaust these, they're all PD-1 high, right? They all look exhausted. So it's a question of, you know, how, do, how does that exhaustion phenotype correlate with metabolism? And we found there's a number of defects. A like glucose uptake was down. Uh, there's a defect in GAP-DH. Uh, there are also some mitochondrial issues, and I'll show you some of that. Uh, so this is the data for the glucose uptake. We use 2-NBDG, which is not the greatest indicator of glucose uptake, but it, sometimes it's the only one that is accessible uh, because it's a fluorescent analog. But normally you activate T cells, they increase this glucose uptake. The TILs don't really do that. Uh, this, this may be an activation issue as much as a glucose uptake issue, but, but nonetheless, they don't increase glucose uptake. Uh, we looked at GAP-DH, and this is just total GAP-DH levels. And people think GAP-DH is this great loading control, and it's always the same, but it's not actually. In fact, the CD8 TILs have, low, have less GAP-DH protein than the control T cells. So they just inherently, this is a rate limiting factor in, in glycolysis as well. So, the, so they do have a, this, this in, intrinsic defect in their ability to do glycolysis. It, at least uh, it's, not, it's not like they're null here. They don't have all the controls. They're not null, but they, they have less. Uh, and then the mitochondria are, are, are fragmented. And they, I'm not sure all the data about the reactive oxygen species, but here's actually some images, some movies we took, some Z-series of, uh, these are peripheral blood and healthy donor T cells, just to give a, a reference. And these are the TILs. Uh, and this is just one, one mouse or not one, one, one T cell. We've quantified this. And you know, what you can see here is you get this nice network of, of mitochondria and the, the control, but in the till, they're all kind of fragmented and they're, the mitochondria are all sort of distributed across the cell. So they got a lot, of, a lot of issues that are showing up in these T cells. Okay, so those issues could be ancillary to some other major problem, or they could actually be one of the things that drives the problem and makes T cells less able to respond. So one way to get at that, that was to get all those, these defects in glucose uptake and glycolysis, as well as mitochondria, we should just be able to give the cells pyruvate. Pyruvate can go into the cells via the same transporters that lactic acid would go out, the MCT transporters. Uh, and it's, a, it's an antioxidant actually, as well as a really good uh, substrate for mitochondria, even if the mitochondria are not as ideal as they could be. And what we found is if we took T cells, these are unstimulated or stimulated with or without pyruvate here. If we stimulated them in the presence of exogenous pyruvate, they could make more granzyme B, more interferon gamma, more TNF alpha. So that actually, I think is pretty important because it says that these metabolic defects that are accumulating or metabolic adaptations, I guess, maybe a better word than defects, um, as those ac accumulate, they are directly contributing to the functional defects of the cell. Because if we start to rescue the metabolic adaptations or defects, we can start to rescue the functional defects. All right, so the metabolism here is a driver of impaired function. All right, and then you can do another experiment. This is a JCI paper that Katie Beckerman uh, and our group did uh, a year or two ago, and where we, we took T cells from kidney tumors and uh, if you gave a nice, strong co-stimulation with CD3, CD28, you got, we got even more of the T cells to activate. So she could get the T cells to regulate CD25. And these are all individual patients and they're, they're matched here. Uh, IL-2, uh, this is cell trace violet. So this is proliferation. Uh, TMRE, so mitochondrial potential go, goes up. Uh, Granzyme B, uh, interferon gamma, TNFL, all these things can go up. You can, you can get the T cells to do it. But in each case, if you add 2 deoxy glucose to decrease glycolysis, prevent the cells from upregulating that glycolytic pathway, uh, they don't do it. So they are reliant on that glycolysis to, uh, to be able to support this effector function. And this, you can see this, it kind of, the co-stimulation can kind of fix some of these aspects, these metabolic aspects. And you know, if you look at the mitochondria, for example, here. So here's sort of uh, T cells from the tumors, Stained for with mitre tracker, which is, shows you where the, where the mitochondria are. Here's IL-7, they're, they're, they're kind of fragmented. Um, CD28, you start to see more networking here. So it looks like the mitochondria is starting to get fixed. If you had 2 d glucose, the, the mitochondria are really, really fragment. So this, this phenotypes start to get rescued with co-stimulation, but that is entirely dependent on being able to do glycolysis. Okay, so then if we're in a situation where T cells are in this kidney tumor environment 
And uh, all these metabolic pathways are, are really important for whether they can respond uh, and what drives their functional impairments. And the glucose glutamine sort of balance is important. Uh, how, how do you actually get at that? So the, the way we think about metabolism, if we sort of step back, is that all these metabolic pathways and everything that's in the metabolic chart here, it's kind of the biochemistry of how cells interpret their microenvironment uh, from all the, from the tissue settings, and there's lots of interactions in the tissues, uh, to the nutrients that are there, amino acids, uh, uh, glucose, lipids, lactate, for example. So all these things, that, of course, that are cofactors, they're signaling mechanisms, epigenetic modifiers. Uh, so how do you go about understanding how cells uh, uh, interpret this. And I guess we are doing a bunch of CRISPR screens on this, but I'm not going to talk about that. What we did instead was, you, you know, here's, there's the CRISPR screening headline. I'm going to talk just about glucose and glutamine metabolism in vivo. And the thought here was that, okay, if T cells need glucose to drive effector function, or the high rates of glucose at least to drive strong effector function, and glutamine, on the other hand, has this ability to, to, to counterbalance that and actually sort of decrease the, uh, the differentiation of the cells, maybe, maybe dampening exhaustion. So, so it's, it's kind of a balance. How does that actually work in a, in a tissue setting like a tumor setting? And the challenge here really is, of course, the tissue is different than everything in vitro that, that I've shown you, and even in some of the more healthy, normal uh, tissues. Uh, and part of the reason it's different is because cancer cells are trying to do the same thing. They're taking up glucose. They also take up glutamine. Ultimately, then this then feeds into uh, biosynthesis, all these anabolic pathways. So, uh, of course, cancer cells are doing this, and one, you know most of the data in the cancer metabolism literature is sort of bulk tumors where they can measure glucose and glutamine, and, uh, but it's a bulk setting, you know, and it kind of has to be that way for a lot of these assays because they're biochemical and you just need a, a good amount of material. But whenever you do these bulk settings, uh, it's just a mixture of cells. There's the cancer cells, but there's also T cells and there's myeloid cells and there's endothelial cells. So it's not really been dissected as to what the individual cells are doing metabolically with the tumors. Uh, in particular, our questions are about T cells and the myeloid cells. And this idea that, well, if within the tumor setting, if the cancer cells are really using up all the glucose and affecting the glutamine, um, how does that affect the other cells? And is there actually competition for maybe a limiting nutrient and glucose would be one of the potentially limiting nutrients. So there's actually data both for and against this idea that uh, molecules like glucose can be limiting. So some of the data for the limitation, uh, this is so nutrient heterogeneity across tumors. These are mouse xenografted tumors where the sections of the tumors were taken out and then uh, enzymatically uh, with a set of standards, measured the levels of glucose across the tumor and, and the same with lactate. And you can see there's, there's plenty of reasons, regions with lots of glucose. They tend to be on the periphery. The center of the tumor, in this case, uh, had very low glucose. So glucose can be uh, undetectable uh, by this assay. Uh, conversely, lactate can be very high. So there are clearly a number of reasons here. And if we were to make the argument that the ability to get access to glucose is important for normal effector T cell function, then clearly the T cells are not gonna do well here or they're gonna to have to find some alternate pathway. Okay, but that's, so this is the mouse xenograft data and, and this part of the tumor may be necrotic, it's hard to know, uh, but what actually happens in kidney cancer? So these are, uh, and this is interstitial fluid that we've collected from, uh, we have 21 normal sections, samples here, and 14 kidney cancer uh, clear cell samples that we collected. And we would uh, we did this with Matt Vander Hayden at MIT, and we used his protocol where, in essence, you just you spin down a chunk of tumor and you collect the fluid off the top. Um, so this could include some degree of cell death. Uh, it's not necessary. You're not guaranteed it's all in interstitial extracellular fluid, but um, for the most part, it. it it seems to, to, to reflect that pretty well in, in Matt's hands. Uh, but what we found is that glucose and lactate, they do change. So glucose actually does go down a bit. Lactate can go up a bit, but they're not really significantly changed. And we got glutamine was actually increased, which is, so, so glutamine is actually more available, if anything, in the tumor. Definitely none of them are depleted and limiting.
Okay, so, so if that's the case, then we want to go back and use the PET imaging sort of model to try to understand uh, what are the nutrients the cells are actually getting. So this is a mouse with a, with a tumor and that's imaged on a micro PET uh, imager with the fluorodeoxy glucose. So there's the, there's the tumor. And, but now we can take it out and fractionate it with different subsets, just the, just the same way I showed you in the, with the asthma earlier. And when we do this, or I'm going to show you a few controls first, I guess. So this is a, this is an MC38 tumor. Uh, we've done a bunch of models. So I'll show you more. Uh, and this is when we make single cell suspensions, we get a nice suspension here. We, for ease, have generally done CD45 negative as our cancer cell fraction. And I know you, the people would say, well, that could include a lot of other things. Uh, but this is actually in these models, it really is just the cancer cells. And we've also done controls where we have had labeled cancer cells that we've specifically pulled out, got the same results. So, so trust me, these are the cancer cells. And then we also get the CD45 fractions. Now, the CD45 cells, this could in principle include cells that are in the blood as opposed to actually infiltrating the tumor. Uh, but we think that's a minor component because if we inject the mice intravenously with a CD45 antibody that's fluorescent labeled, uh, you know, let's say five minutes before we euthanize the mice. Everything in the blood gets labeled, as you'd expect. In the spleen, we get a partial labeling that might reflect a red pulp, white pulp distribution. Uh, and in the tumor, uh, there's a few cells up here. These are probably uh, the blood transiting cells, and then, but the vast majority are, are tissue resident. Okay, so, so we're getting a pretty good mixture uh, of, uh, of tissue resident cells. And then we can also titrate the, the sensitivity of this when we do the, the FTG. Uh, uh, approach and and we can measure glucose uptake with this uh, with very linear and very down to low cell numbers. Okay, so so what actually happens then? So the the title is the is the take home. It's is the hematopoietic cells, not more so than the cancer cells. So this is FT, uh, FTG PET uh, uh, Renka here. The spleen is a PET negative tissue, so we use it as our negative control. There's not PET avid, whereas the whole tumor lights up by PET, and we can get that if we look at the counts per million uh, in the per cell, per, per million cells. Uh, the CD45 negative fraction of the tumor cells are pretty similar to the whole tumor, but the CD45 positive fraction is much higher. So the hematopoietic cells are actually more effective at taking up glucose than the cancer cells. And this is in Renka, which is a biopsy kidney cancer. Uh, MC38, which is a black six uh, colorectal cancer. And then we've done a variety of other models, another colorectal breast, uh, or this is Renka sub Q. This is Renka where we've injected into the kidney. It's the same result there, a genetically engineered model and an infl inflammation induced model. And they all give to, to, to varying little fine dif differences, but uh, the overall results are the same, but every model. Okay, now each of the models has different you know, degrees and kinds of cell infiltrations. Uh, so this is uh, the spleen as a control, but then the MC38, Renka, and the, this genetically engineered uh, breast cancer model, they have a lot of cells that are falling into this CD45 fraction here. Uh, there's T cells, there's lots of myeloid cells. So you can divide this up. And, you know, the way we have to do this is we have to use magnetic beads to, to do these separations because they don't really can't really do it on a cell sorter. The flow, flow core doesn't like you to show up with radioactive cells. So we're a little bit limited as to how fine we can get, but nonetheless, we can, we can do a fair bit with sort of commercial magnetic beads. And so just show you a little bit, this is when we pulled out uh, F480 positive tumor associated macrophages and versus just T cells. And purities here is not outstanding in this particular experiment. We've had others that were better, um, but it gives you an idea. And so here's the spleen, there's the whole tumor, there's the cancer cells. So the tumor is PET positive. That's what you'd see in the PET imaging. Uh, there's the cancer cells. But of the cells that are in the tumor, the F480 positive tumor associated macrophages uh, on a per cell basis are the, are the huge winners. And here's the T cells and here's all the other hematopoietic cells. So uh, it's, again, it is, the, it is really the macrophages that are taking up the glucose and T cells and again, the T cells are small relative to the cancer cells. So uh, uh, this is a per cell basis, a per volume basis. I think T cells are doing a little bit better here and stuff. Uh, so that's using, uh, our, of course, our glucose, in vivo glucose uptake. We wanted to have a, another way to see, is that really the case, uh, that the macrophages are really the most metabolically active? So we isolated those same cell fractions and did seahorse 
to measure oxygen consumption and extracellular acidification. And uh, again, the, the, the macrophages are sort of the big winners here in terms of the most metabolically active. So it's not the cancer cells that are the most metabolically active in a tumor, it's actually the macrophages. Uh, but then the question is, well, what are the cancer cells actually doing? And so we did gene expression analysis. Here's just the PCA plot. You can sort of see that the, uh, the CD4 have negative cells. The cancer cells are way off in the corner here. And, and just looking at the gene set enrichment for those cells, it's a metabolism of amino acids, um, fatty acid biosynthesis, fatty acid metabolism. But amino acids are really the, the most enriched metabolic pathway. Uh, but lipids too. So, so we tested both. So lipids we can test. There's a fluorescent lipid dye, C16 of palmitate bodipi. And so we stain the, uh, these fractions of cells. These are cancer cells, macrophages, uh, high and low, and these are T cells. And basically you see that the CD45 negative cells have a much higher MFI. And uh, you, you, <laughs> this is what my students do. They're not exactly sure where they drew the gate, but they got this massive increase in C16 bodipi here. Uh, so, so the cancer cells are taking up lipids. Now, this is an ex vivo uptake assay, just the way we do this guy. Uh, but we can go back and use the PET imaging approach for glutamine, where we have F18 labeled glutamine, and do the PET. And so then this is MC38, and this is Renka. So here's the spleen, the non-PET avid tissue, the tumor. So you can use glutamine PET, and you can get a nice signal there. Uh, the cancer cells have a higher glutamine uptake. And then the, uh, the immune cells actually have a lower glutamine uptake. So it looks like the cancer cells are actually preferentially taking up glutamine as opposed to the immune cells. And you can break this down based on uh, T cells or non-T cells. And so the, the non-T cells, these are the myeloid cells and the T cells. So they're actually taking up roughly the same amount. They are taking up glutamine though. This is way higher still than the, uh, the spleen. So the T cells in the spleen, the myeloid cells in the spleen are not taking up as much glutamine as in the, as in the tumor. So when I say they're not, that they're not taking, <laughs> they take up a lot of glucose, they're taking up a lot of glutamine as well, just uh, not as much as the cancer cells. Okay, so the one other experiment you can do that's actually, I think, really informative is what happens if we target glutamine uptake? In this case, we used an inhibitor of ASCT2. There's multiple glutamine transporters. So this is, again, not necessarily a complete block of glutamine uptake, but it, it can be pretty good. So here we, we used V9302 and looked in the spleen tumor, and then we had the fractionated CD4 based on CD45 in this case. Uh, and what you see is in each case where the inhibitor is present, glutamine uptake goes down, which is, again, what should happen. The uh, block glutamine uptake and our measurement of glutamine uptake goes down. But what's interesting is if you look at the glucose uptake, when we do the, the FDG uh, glucose um, and use the, the glutamine inhibitor. Now here we actually broke it down to the myeloid cells uh, and cancer cells and then others, um, which is we largely T cells here. And what you see is actually there's an increase in glucose uptake kind of across the board. Uh, we have more data that I need to probably update this. Uh, so these are significant here. So you block glutamine uptake, glucose uptake goes up. So that tells you two things that are important. One is that the glutamine and glucose uptake uh, and, and use presumably then uh, are, are linked and compensate for each other. You need to have a certain amount of glutamine. If you don't have that, then you, you respond by taking up more glucose. Okay, so there's, so there's this balance between the two. The other thing that's really important, it says, is when the cell decides to take up more glucose, it, it can. Right? So the glucose uptake is not limited by the level of glucose in the microenvironment. It's not limited by access to glucose because there's more glucose there that can be taken up if the cell chooses to. So glucose is not necessarily then limiting in the microenvironment. All right, so this gives us a model here. I'm going to basically wrap up now, I think, uh, where if, if we just sort of simplify the tumor microenvironment to T cells, macrophages, and cancer cells, and again, there's there's lots of other players, but if we just think about these two and glucose and glutamine, and, and we'll throw the lipids on here too. Uh, the macrophages are the most metabolically active cell within the tumor. They're taking up lots of glucose. They are taking up glutamine as well. T cells are also pretty metabolically active. They're taking up less glucose, but some, but they're also taking up glutamine. So again, there's a, there's 
some sort of balance here for each of these. Now, cancer cells are exactly the opposite, where they don't take up as much glucose as we think they do. They do take up some, so it's not a zero, uh, but what they're really good at taking up is glutamine and lipid. And this seems, this model seemed to be the case across a bunch of different tumor types that we looked at. And so we kind of think about this, you know, kind of put it together. I mean, glucose promotes, but glutamine actually suppresses TH1s and CTL differentiation and function. So this balance here might be important for the T cell differentiation. And glutamine metabolism, if it's higher, it decreases glucose. That then has an effect on the, uh, the, the exhaustion state of the cells. So if you block glutamine metabolism, glucose goes up, but so do exhaustion markers. So maybe this low glutamine uptake here is contributing to the exhaustion and maybe modifying glutamine, we might be able to have some effects there. So that's a question that we're sort of actively looking at right now. The other things that are important sort of at a practical level are, you know, PET images, of course, are, are done all the time. And uh, the, the thought is, oh, this is reflecting the tumor glucose uptake. But that Oh, is an oversimplification because it sort of says the tumor glucose uptake, uh, but that's not necessarily the cancer cell glucose uptake. Uh, and actually, a lot of the glucose uptake in a tumor is going to be inflammation dependent, uh, hematopoietic cells, potentially, you know, other stromal cells potentially. That, but it's, it's not so much the cancer cell. Cancer cells are really good at taking up things like glutamine and taking up lipids. So uh, the glucose competition, we think, in, in in tumors, we think it's pretty modest. And we think this PET imaging actually reflects a large inflammatory component, or at least certainly mild tumor. Now, the, the, a couple of points to that. One is that uh, cancer cells are still taking up glucose. So there's a lot of cancer cells in many tumors, so they can still drive a PET image signal. But you also have many PET images that are very positive that come from tumors that don't have a lot of cancer cells relative to the stromal components. And so that so the, the, those are clearly driven by the inflammatory uh, environment. And then you've got kidney cancer, which in principle should be the most pet avid based on the loss of EHL. And it tends to not be particularly pet avid. So that might reflect some changes in some of the metabolism of some of these other cells and the infiltration and the, maybe the roles of the macrophages. And then that, that's a question that we're looking at as well. And we actually are in the process of, of doing a small little clinical study where we'll uh, do serial imaging of, of kidney cancer patients with uh, glutamine PET and then glucose PET and then uh, prior to surgery and then take the tumor out and, and try to see if there's any correlates with the, uh, the cell populations that are within the tumor as well as potential regional variation. Uh, and with that, I will end. Um, so I said at the very beginning, a lot of this is the CR squared lab, uh, is, uh, the Kim Rathmel lab and my lab. Uh, interact a great deal. We each have our sort of the Venn diagram, right? So I have some bits that are independent, so is she, but the kidney cancer work for us is uh, is largely shared. Uh, so here, here's the group at a retreat a couple years ago now. Here we were this last summer where we squeezed it in pre-Delta when we were vaccinated. Now it's kind of nice we can start to get together again. Uh, this, we had two MSTP students who really led uh, the, the PET imaging project, uh, Matt Madden in my lab and Brad Reinfeld in, in Kim's lab. And I'm happy to take any uh, additional questions at this point. I don't think I'll stop stop there. So, Hi, Jeff. Time. Thank you so much. This was uh, Ari Hakimi here from Sloan. Uh, yeah, so, so, such great work. And uh, we're keenly interested in some of the similar questions, although certainly don't have your metabolic uh, insights at all at all times. I'm just curious your thoughts. You know, as you pointed out at the beginning, the, the T cell infiltration is so high. One of the confounding factors has, has ultimately been, you know, what is driving high T cell response in this tumor type if it's not clearly driven by mutations or, or, or neoantigens. And I'm just curious your thought on whether there's specific microenvironments that are more favorable for recruiting T cells. And if so, you know, are there other examples of this paradigm and what could be leading to that, for example? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, my answer is pretty simple. I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of T cells in, in these tumors. I mean, you would think that they would be like ridiculously responsive to immune therapy. I mean, they respond, but it's not like anything particularly special, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of T cells in there. CD8 cells, CD4 cells, a lot of NK cells as well. 
uh, the myeloid populations are the same ones that seem to correlate with some responses. Um, so we're this, is, we're, we're this is why we're kind of shifting some of our attentions to those myeloid cells. But I don't know what's driving the T cell recruitment to the kidney tumors and why they have so many. And if there's something special about either the myeloid cell populations or if there's something different about the T cells that might be sort of special in the kidney. And because the kidney has enough things going on with it in terms of the microenvironment that could be relatively unique anyway. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. I had a number of questions, so since nobody's asking, I'll ask maybe a couple. Uh, one question that I had was about uh, the difference that you're seeing in the macrophages versus the cancer cells in terms of their glucose uptake. Have you uh, tried to map the fate of the glucose that is taken up? So maybe the macrophages are using the glucose for like oxidative burst type of a response, whereas the cancer cell as our typical understanding are using it for more anaplerotic, like basic block building purposes. Uh, is there a functional division of labor? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for those experiments, you'd really need to do C13 tracing uh, and then do the mass spec after. And we have not done those, no. I mean, that's something that kind of we've had on our list to do. Uh, we've been a little bit slow to get to it in part because um, the you know by the time you isolate the cells i'm always a little uncomfortable never really certain about how things have changed ex vivo i mean certainly people are doing it and getting nice results that that all kind of tend to make generally make sense so it's so it's something that we're going to try but we we haven't we haven't done it i don't think it would be interesting to see uh if the glucose that's even going into these cells is doing the same thing i'd actually be pretty surprised if it was yeah, particularly in a kidney cancer uh, setting where you got this you know, so much lipid generation. Yeah, and so so that actually so you you hit upon the other point that I was thinking of. So the fact that you can take the cells out from the tumor and then recapitulate what might what we think are going to be physiologically critical changes means that there has to be some degree of memory from that 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 is retained ex vivo after the cells have been isolated, right? Uh, and yes. So, yeah. Uh, the, the question then is, uh, if you were to do the same experiment taking the tails from a non-RCC, would you see the same metabolic adaptation or would the kidney TIF have provided a completely different uh, program for the cells to have adapted? Yeah, you know, there's a number of other groups who have been looking at these kind of things. Uh, just try to say, what is the metabolic state of tills and, and, and different kind of cancers? Uh, and there's some there's some differences, but for the most part, the trends are pretty similar. You know, some you know, poor at glucose uptake glycolysis, fragmented mitochondria. Uh, you know, we see high reactive oxygen species. We also see high high potential, so that could be indicative of disrupted mitochondria. Uh, other groups have actually seen low potential, uh, but but at the same time, mitochondrial defects do seem to underlie a lot of this, and that's been seen in a variety of settings. So there, there could be some parts that are too kidney specific, but uh, the general findings are, are pretty universal, it seems. Ed has a question. So Jeff, yeah, I have a question. Um, I was wondering how to, um, interpret your sort of cell specific observations with, um, for example, like Ralph's isotope tracing data of bulk clear cell tumors, where, for example, he sees that the tumors very strongly prefer to ferment glucose to lactate. So in my head, when I'm squaring it with your data, because so much of the signal has to be coming, so much of the uptake at least, has to be coming from non-malignant cell populations. It sort of suggests that all of the cell populations in the tumor are fermentative, right? Yeah, tends to. I mean, again, there's a lot of cancer cells in these mixed, and we showed the data on a you know, per cell basis. So if you take a chunk of tumor, 
and you know, 80% of the cells are cancer cells, that's going to dominate the signal. Uh, so in Ralph's case, yeah, he does see that you get a lot of lactate secretion from uh, a C13 bolus, you know, prior, prior to surgery. But that's a mixture of cells. It's hard to know exactly what the balance is. And I, and I, we don't, again, all we measured was the uptake. We didn't say what the glucose does. So it could be going to lactate and all these. Different. Yeah, no, I, I guess that that's the sort of provocative conclusion that like I would draw, which is that even in the non-malignant cells, you have a lot of glucose carbon going to lactate rather than entering the TCA cycle. Yeah, I think that that's, that's not unreasonable at all. I mean, it's always a balance. So there's a fair bit that's going to go into the mitochondria, but there's always going to be some there's going to be some lactate secretion too. And it's it's a hypoxic microenvironment at the end of the day, right? So the TCA already probably is going to be impacted by the by the absence of oxygen anyway. So you could artificially skew the metabolism of all non-cancerous cells also in the same for the yeah, yeah. direction by that mechanism. Any other questions? I have, right. I have one quick question, one quick follow-up question. Uh, when you were looking at the TCGA data, that it was more like broadly more RNA signal for C8, there were differences related to staging or there were like subsets of the clear cell renal cell carcinoma that had some like more abundance of these T cell subsets. That yeah, you know, like... we, yeah, uh, we did that analysis like five years ago. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, and to be honest, I'm not sure that we did it in enough detail anyway to, to give you a good answer. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I, I just don't recall. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I think, thank you again, Jeff. Maybe everybody can just thank Jeff for a really stimulating talk. Uh, probably a lot of uh, follow-up ideas might emerge out of this and we'll talk right. to you and hope to hear updates from your lab. Yeah, all right, well, thank you very much.